Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Cohen. I'm the president of The Atlantic. Uh, welcome, and thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, we're gathered to talk this afternoon about ideas for reforming our criminal justice system. The topic today, Rethinking Crime and Punishment, is part of The Atlantic's Next America series, which looks at the United States through the lens of demographic change. Over the next hour or so, we'll have three mini panels on this subject. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation's Safety and Justice Challenge for making this afternoon possible. A quick housekeeping note, we are on Twitter at hashtag TheAtlanticDNC. Let me start with a few facts. Among industrialized nations, the United States has the highest incarceration rate. Our jails and prisons currently hold more than two million inmates. Expert, experts link this not to an increase in crime, but to harsher laws and longer sentences. And of course, racial disparities play a role here. African Americans are jailed at a rate almost four times that of whites. This is the story across the nation and in Pennsylvania. In response to these realities here in Philadelphia, with a grant from the MacArthur Foundation, the city is investing in a variety of strategies to reduce average daily jail population. So we're gonna talk about all of this and explore what change could look like right now. Please welcome first the mayor of Philadelphia, Jim Kenney. <laughs> mayor Kenney served for 23 years on the city council before winning election as mayor last year. Philadelphia Magazine has called him Mr. Criminal Justice Reform, and he has supported decriminalizing marijuana, eliminating cash bail for low-level defendants, ending stop and frisk, and a moratorium on new jail construction. Also, please welcome John Wetzel, the Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, and a, a leading national voice on these issues. Since taking office in 2010, Wetzel has focused on reducing reliance on incarceration while at the same time improving outcomes for offenders. Joining them in conversation is my colleague and friend, Ron Brownstein, Senior Editor at The Atlantic. Thanks, Bob. Your, I don't want to steal the mayor's water. I don't want to carry the mayor's water, but I don't want to steal the mayor's water. Um, good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us. As Bob mentioned, uh, we're very excited to have this conversation, which is part of our Next America project at The Atlantic, which explores how growing diversity is changing the national agenda. And I hope you all will visit us on The Atlantic website, where we provide coverage of these issues every day. We're here to talk about criminal justice reform, but of course, the predicate of that is public safety. And so I want to start by asking you, to react to the portrait that we heard at the Republican convention last week of the state of public safety you don't want in America you don't want and in that. America's big cities. Um, is Philadelphia getting safer or more dangerous uh, as, well, the, uh, as the argument went in, in Cleveland? Well, first of all, I mean, what happened in Cleveland was an abomination. I've never seen such vitriol and, and hate and division, uh, and it's not what our country's about. I mean, it was like, if it wasn't so serious, it would have been funny. Um, it was like the World Wrestling Federation. It was like, it was like, and, and Trump was like Vince McMahon. It was like, um, but the, the issue is, is that safety, criminal justice reform actually creates safety. It's not the other way around. You don't, the more you lock people up, we're clear, clearly not as safe, not safe because you've locked more people up. Um, I went into a, um, in the House of Correction, not the House of Correction, the Philadelphia Industrial Correction Center for a graduation. One of the Mothers in Charge programs was doing a, an event for some of the young men who were incarcerated there, kind of getting used to coming back and yeah. anger management and the thing. So and it was a nice, well, nice graduation, you know, mortarboard, cap and gown, families, fun. Uh, and I'm getting picture taken with this young man. He's like, I figure he's 27 years old or so. And he's from South Philly. So I'm from South Philly. And we started a little talk about like the neighborhood. And I said, you know, you're getting out soon. I said, what did, did you have like a skill? Did you have a job before? I mean, what did you do? He looked at me and went, Man, I sold drugs since I was 14. Were you crazy? Like, in other words, like, I had never done anything else than this. And, that's, and that, I think, is part and parcel of why people get locked up in the first place, is that you either have a drug, you have, you have no opportunity or hope for a job because you're not educated because the government has systemically defunded education in America and in Pennsylvania. Um, you have, you go to the street, you wind up maybe doing drugs and become a drug addicted, and then you wind up doing things because of your addiction <coughs> that puts you in jail. I mean, we have seven thousand or so people incarcerated in our county system, 60% plus of them 
<coughs> cannot make bail. Hmm. I haven't been before a judge yeah. just because they have no job or a family member who can pay their bail. They sit for $140 a day for 30, 60, 90 days before they see a judge. Let's, we'll come back in a moment to the, your, your uh, initiatives to deal with this. But, uh, Secretary Wetzel, let me ask you, is the state of Pennsylvania, if you look at it across the board, are you getting safer or is it, or is it becoming more dangerous? Yeah, I mean, we're certainly becoming safer. I mean, certainly you can't argue that, that there is a blip up in crime. But, but frankly, anecdotes are what got us here. I mean, they've, they've uh, you know, four decades of bad criminal <coughs> justice policy have, have gotten us a, a bloated system with, with no return on investment. So you can make the argument on the right. Is it a good investment to invest $2.4 billion in a State Department of Corrections <coughs> when we know that low-level individuals who come in state prison come out more likely to commit a crime? That makes absolutely no sense. And, and, and frankly, the only path forward is data. And what the data tells us, Pew Foundation put out two years ago, is the states with the biggest reduction in their, their prison population also experienced the biggest reduction in crime. Um, so we really have to, th this politics of fear um, really doesn't have a place if we want to continue to move forward but, and make better decisions in the criminal justice. Any thought, though, on why you're seeing that blip? What, what, what is the, yeah, I mean, what is, what so is, you, what is we, I mean, guns? We've, guns. Guns. But we've certainly seen a couple decades of crime reduction. Right, right. And even the blip is below. Right, way below the Yeah, right. so let's not, no. let's not right. panic at one right. number. Uh, right. I mean, it, it's, very, it's very easy to, to pull a statistic out, put no context behind it, and then say, oh, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. Put it in context. And in context, yes, it's increased, but it's still low. Uh, it's still at historic lows. For example, Philadelphia, I think, had more murders in 2015 than 2014, but still way below the level as recently as 2012. I mean, Absolutely. So yeah. it's important to put that context and data, and that's where we have to Why do you think? What, what are you saying? One murder's too much. I mean, we, and, and I'll tell you what, it's also when it comes to counting murders, and homicide seems to be the, like kind of the number one thing. I think shootings are as important as homicides. Because, for example, if you have a, a deranged person who kills their family or kills a couple of people in their family in their house, how do you police that? I mean, how, what, what, what law enforcement uh, strategies can you put about to stop that from happening? But they still go on the homicide count. Um, shootings are up. I mean, you can't, I don't understand the disconnect between people who are unfettered when it comes to the availability of guns and then on the other hand argue about crime being high or shootings being high. I mean, that's... And we, we find ourselves at a loss because the feds won't do anything about it. The state, this is, you know, gun state of you know, Pennsylvania, gun heaven. Um, and we, we're stuck here. As I said the other day, we deal with the carnage of gun violence in Philadelphia when in Somerset County it's a matter of culture and family and sport and shooting. And I understand that. I'm not denigrating that. But they got to help us do something here. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about both at the state level and the city and the municipal level. There are significant criminal justice reform efforts underway. I want to start with the city because I mean, if you look at the reform of the jails in, in, in Philadelphia, it has been an issue literally for decades. I mean, you had law. I think I believe the first lawsuits on overcrowding on jails go back to 1971. You built new jail facilities in the 80s and 90s to deal with it. You've had it. You've had a, 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 a period when you went for a crackdown on people who don't appear in court. You've had more lawsuits. Now you have another major reform effort underway. Tell me though first, what have you? learn from this four decades of efforts before? What are, the, what are the main lessons you take from what had been done before? It was a mistake. And we kept on compounding the mistake by building more prisons. Um, we spend $40,000 a year or so to incarcerate a person in our county prison system. And it's seven, it's seven to eight, nine thousand dollars to provide pre-K for every child in the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you provide pre-K for every child in the city at $8,000 a year, you're saving 40 on the other end. I mean, and no one seems to get that. Now, I grew up, I mean, I was born in 58, so I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and it was like this law and order, you know, Vietnam era, civil rights era, lock them up, blah, blah, blah. And, and in Rizzo, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're still digging out from that uh -huh. stuff. Um, <laughs> when I first got nominated, a lady in South Philadelphia said, meet the next Frank Rizzo. I went, no, no. No. <laughs> no. Um, we... We need to look holistically, and, and, and Secretary Wetzel's been, been at the forefront of doing mm. this on the state level. I mean, these are, these are human beings who have gone astray. Um, look, if you kill somebody, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be with him for the rest of your life. Our guys are in there for 23 months, you know, on anything under two years. Um, we have to do something more with them than just house them. I mean, and those, those guys need to come out of that, that, that prison with a CDL license, with the ability to weld, with the ability to have a, a, a high school education, maybe a community college education, and we need to do that in, in the facility while we're, or, or get them out 
of the facility to do it. In this earlier period, 1999, 2008, the average daily inmate count increased by 45% in Philadelphia. It peaked in 2008, it's down from there, but still, when the Vera Institute looked at the 40 biggest counties in the US, as you know, the average incarceration in Philadelphia was higher than any, uh, higher than any other, uh, you know, basically triple the average level for the 40 uh, largest counties in America. Why is it so high in Philadelphia? Because the poverty rate's so high. I mean, po you're, it's like it's a, if you fix the education and poverty situation, your jail, your jail population will go down. I mean, the, the aspirational goal is not to need a jail at all, I mean, in a county level. Mm -hmm. um, but it, w people in Harrisburg don't want to fund education but would build a jail in a second. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are counties in Pennsylvania that their entire industry is based on incarceration. Um, I mean, there's something wrong with that. In addition to opportunity, though, a very specific fact is the average length of stay for inmates nationally in, in, in county jails is 23 days. For Philadelphia, it's about 90 days. Right. Why so high? Uh, bail, cash bail. Um, cash bail, really. I mean, uh, if you can't, if, you, if a judge thinks you're a viable risk to let go at a bail number and you can't make that bail number, I'd rather pay the bail than to keep them locked up for 90 days. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, we'll come back to this. Let's talk about, at the state level, you also have an effort underway, the Justice Reinvestment uh, Working Group, which I believe is supposed to produce recommendations for the 2017? Correct, the, le next, legislative the next session. legislative session. What have you learned about the, the statewide policies, and can you give us a sense of where this effort is going? Yeah, really, the, you know, the governor cooked this off earlier this year, and he, and he really kicked it off, I think, in a smart way by saying that the goal of this is less crimes and less victims. And that's what, we're, that's what all this is about. Mm -hmm. so let's not glaze over numbers. I mean, we want safer communities. But um, the just reinvestment in particular is focusing on population drivers and how, as a, a criminal justice system, we can make better decisions. And we know that incarceration is best used with precision. And in order to do that, we need to make good decisions at the front end. But the reality is, in Pennsylvania, we don't have any statewide policy on how we set bail. So when that initial decision is bad, it's like garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. We get bad outcomes. And, and I know justice is supposed to be blind, but it can't be blind to outcomes. And, and historically, justice has been blind to outcomes. So this focus is gathering data and looking at how we can make better decisions on the front end. Very interesting piece of data came out at the last meeting that looked at the uh, number of Pennsylvanians under criminal justice control. Yeah. That includes county jail, uh, county probation and parole, which we call it here, uh, state prison and state parole, Pennsylvania is third in the country under correctional control. Big driver of that is the fact that Pennsylvania has extraordinary long probation. So even if someone's sentenced to a local jail, and part of what drives the length of stay in Philadelphia is that Pennsylvania's state, um, state law allows for twice the length of stay of most states. So most states, local incarceration is capped at a year, Pennsylvania is capped at 23 months. So that would artificially drive that you up. You know, that data that you've been collecting, one of the most striking numbers in, in the early uh, effort, since 2000, 2004 to 2014, uh, the incarceration rate in Pennsylvania up 20%. Meanwhile, New York and New Jersey, right adjacent, down 20% over the same period. What is your best uh, analysis of why you have such a divergence? Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty simple. 2009, there was a parole moratorium that basically shut down the parole mm -hmm. system for a long period of time that, that caused about a 2,500 inmate, inmate increase. And what we've seen 24 years before I got this job, our population was growing by 1,500 inmates a year. So we were adding a prison every 18 months. The good news is since 2012, we've seen about a 1% a year reduction. Now, no one's dislocating their shoulder, patting themselves on the back over 1%. Mm. But we've certainly uh, changed it around. And I think we're doubling down on that uh, under, under Governor Wolf by focusing on the root cause. So the mayor uh, mentioned education. Education is a root cause. 50% of everybody who comes into state prison doesn't have a high school diploma. So don't be surprised if you have a terrible education system that people are getting locked up. What share of the people who come into state prison have an addiction problem? 70%. 70% so of our population has a substance use issue, 27% uh, a mental health issue. Those aren't necessarily discrete populations. But again, so uh, poor education, not having an adequate behavior health uh, safety net that includes both addiction and, um, and, and mental health. I mean, one of the, one of the keystones of, of the governor's approach is really focusing on this opioid ep epidemic. Mm -hmm. and, and the cool part is, uh, and I've been in, in these round tables all over, all over the state, and for the first time since I, and I've been in this field a long time, first time I'm hearing people say we can't arrest a way out of it. 
um, that, that these are our brothers and sisters. And I say, I agree with you. It, it, that goes for the 50,000 people who are locked up who may not be from your area, that we need to make better decisions. And that's what that says. And that speaks to the humanity of people who are incarcerated. That speaks to an understanding that, that we shouldn't judge people by their worst day. And we need to make good decisions. And that decision needs to be consistent with putting someone on a path to not commit another crime. I saw a figure in your uh, grant proposal that 13% of your jail population had mental health issues, which is, which is a kind of a stunning number. I don't know what the, uh, the, the addiction number is, but how does, how does that, what, what the uh, well, I mean, first secretary all, I mean, was we're, saying? We're, lucky, we're locking point. these guys up for selling drugs on the street corner. Largest drug, deal, drug dealers in the world are the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, you have, you have these pharmaceutical companies giving pill docs free stuff to give out as free samples. So people then get addicted to what they're being giving, and when it's done, then they move to the heroin. And I mean, we have we have 300 people or so up in Kensington living along railroad tracks, and the mm -hmm. thing they're all her mostly heroin addicted, and not just adults, but kids. I mean, so we, we have a huge problem when it comes to addiction, uh, and we talk about alcohol and you know decriminalizing marijuana. I mean. Big deal. I mean, we, we decriminalized marijuana to keep 83% of the people being arrested for, for possession who are African American or people of color. I mean, I, I used to, I said all the time during the, the debate on decriminal mar marijuana, I said if you want to arrest a lot of people smoking marijuana, go to the Eagles tailgate on a Sunday, and you can arrest all the New Jersey and suburbanites you want, but they're all white. And 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 I'm and I'm not judging them because I they can do whatever they want. I'm not, not judging it. Mm -hmm. But you can't you can't do an illegal pedestrian stop. Uh, or a bad pedestrian stop on a 20-year-old black kid who happens to have a joint in his pocket and he winds up getting locked up with handcuffs? That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Let me show you another uh, statistic that jumped out at me in kind of looking at this. Uh, a chart from the Prison Policy Initiative. It said that in 1983, if you looked at all the people in all the jails, county, you know, local municipal jails around America, half of them was divided evenly between people who were convicted already and people who are awaiting trial. Now, it's up to 70% of the, of the people in local jails are people who have not been convicted and are awaiting trial. And since 2000, 99% of the total increase in the population has been among those who are awaiting trial. How, is that, uh, how does that compare to what you're seeing in Philadelphia, and how do you deal with that well, issue? I think the number, and I'm not, don't hold right. me to it, but 60-some percent yeah, wow. here. And I think that has to do, and what we're doing now with the MacArthur Grant is dealing with the court system. The court system is very open to having this discussion with us, the district attorney and how they charge, um, and, and, and the prison, and the prison uh, administrator, administration on how we deal with this. But, the, but, it, but it, it's, up to some, it's up to a judge all the time as to what level of bail and what level of probation and other things that, that they, they institute. So talking to the judges and getting them on board is a very important Part of this. And as part of this, though, you're developing an algorithm, correct, that is, that is designed to be used in deciding what right. level of risk someone right. uh, presents. To, uh, how, do, how do you go about doing that? Well, I mean, it's not for, I don't, I don't. I, I'm not, you're not doing it, I assume, right. Thank, thank right, God. Right. I mean, I'm not. You look like an algorithm, right, right, an algorithm right, yeah. expert. That's me. I had trouble <laughs> with right. statistics and guys. Um, um, we're working with the experts and the people who are advising us on the, based on the, the, the ability to get this grant and to move forward. I, mean, I, w I wonder, is that something that, you, that, that needs to be made public, what the actual algorithm is, so people can kind of understand what you are determining as to be the risk factors? Well, it factors? is. I mean, the, the, factors, the factors certainly will be public. And there's, there's it will a, be. There's been a bit of a discussion around... Um, whether whether using risk assessment is biased, but but the, the my first response to that is compare it to our current system, right? Mm -hmm. If it's less biased, we're making progress. So let's let's put, again put it in context. But the reality is, when you go to the doctor's office, you don't have somebody, and in many cases, someone who is not a medical expert guessing at what your treatment should be. No, they put you through a series of tests, and those tests suggest what's wrong with you, and also suggest a path to make you healthier. And so risk assessment is simply looking at factors that predict uh, criminality with the focus on allowing us as a criminal justice system to put you on a path to be less likely to commit a crime. Another big piece of this mayor, uh, of your proposal, Mr. Mayor, is something you mentioned right at the beginning, which is moving it was the question of bail and the role right. of bail. And it says in your, in your, in your uh, grant application, you said you will establish a robust range of alternatives to cash bail based on risk level. What can well, you I mean, do? You can put a bracelet on somebody's mm -hmm. ankle. I mean, mm -hmm. they're pretty effective in determining where a person's going, whether they're leaving the house, going to work, going to, uh, to a drug rehab, or going to counseling, uh, or, or just you know, absconding and going out and doing what they're doing. But I mean, and that's much cheaper than, than having someone incarcerated. Um, can I ask both of you, what do you think is the big, it's an ambitious goal, reducing the number of people in, in, in your jails by a third uh, over the next several years. 
What is going to be the biggest obstacle to getting that done? I think having all the, all the, all the stakeholders on the same page. I think convincing a judge that following what we're going to hopefully recommend is not going to get that judge criticized for letting somebody go as a bad guy. Hmm. And I think that's part of, part of it is, is the politics side of it. And, and look, I'm not, our judges are good people, and they're, and they're, and they're conscientious, and, they're, and they do a good job. It's just getting them on the page where they understand that this, this change will affect everything in a positive way. Same question at the state level. Obviously, part of this effort is, I would assume, to reduce the burden, the level of incarceration in the state. What's going to be the hardest part of making that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think common sense, and by common sense, quote unquote, uh, we equate locking people off with being safe. And, and so anybody will do anything for public safety. I mean, but the reality is we need to make better decisions at the front end. And, and when we do that, we get better outcomes. And I, I think it, it's just that simple. I mean, what they're trying to do here, here in Philadelphia, I don't think it's a high bar. Make good decisions. Bail is the key to both the state system and the local system. I mean, if we don't make good decisions at the front end, you say it's about public safety. But if I'm a rich guy who sexually assaults yeah. someone and you're a poor guy who steals a six pack of tidy whities from Walmart and you're bailed 50 bucks, my bail is 5 million, I have 5 million, I'm getting out. You don't have 50 bucks, you're staying in. That's not about public safety, that's about money. And our system is predicated on money. Do you, do you need. Do you need crime to be going down in order to maintain the political support to undertake these efforts? Listen, we kept locking more and more people up and crime kept going up, all right? Mm -hmm. So, so let's, it, all I say is let's base it on outcomes. And if we measure our current decisions on outcomes, we're, we're failing on the outcomes. And if you base right? it solely on public opinion, you'll never get there because mm -hmm. everybody's afraid. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're afraid of what they imagine is there. I mean, and, and I'm not saying the crime should <clears> be feared. But the point is, is that all this imaginary thing that, that folks were like myself were raised on, uh, and you know, and, and grew up in, was lock them up, lock them all up, you know, and throw away the key. Well, that's it's it's doesn't it's not sustainable, and it doesn't make any sense, and it's not humane, and it's not cost effective. I would go a step further though. Yeah. I would say we should be measuring every single public policy as it relates to criminal justice by outcomes, mm -hmm. and when they work, we should keep doing that. When they don't work, we should stop doing that. It's pretty groundbreaking criminal justice because we what? just keep doing the same damn thing yeah, over and yeah, over again. Yeah. Hoping for a different result, as uh, <laughs> Albert Einstein and Bill Clinton like to say. Um, <laughs> one outcome that you focus on a lot, uh, Mr. Wetzel, is uh, recidivism. And you said, you wrote an article for the Washington Post, and you said, refraining from referring to those who have committed a crime as offenders, I do not excuse their behavior or minimize the impact they've had on those they've offended, nor do I disrespect victims by respecting those who have victimized. Rather, I acknowledge the humanity of incarcerated individuals despite their damaging behavior, and as importantly, acknowledge their capacity to change. How much of the current problem in Philadelphia and the state and the country comes from the ingrained idea that prisoners are, are in some ways not uh, redeemable? Yeah, I mean, any time it's them, we can do whatever we want to them. And, and I just think that you know, when, when I wrote this groundbreaking thing about humanizing people and not calling them names on the way out the door, um, people would say, well, what are we supposed to call them? And I'd just say, what would you call a, a family member if they're coming out? You call them by their, their name, right? And, and so I think everything we do in the criminal justice system, we should do with a focus on getting an outcome. And if, if labeling someone is going to forward, I mean, I remember all the way back to self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. and they tell teachers, what you, what you believe about the kid has a, as big an impact on how they're going to perform in a school. The same thing here. Um, I think it's important that we understand the humanity of individuals who come through our system. And this heroin epidemic, as horrible as it is, has a lot of people saying people who are addicted, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person in spite of the fact that they may be committing crimes. And again, I say the same thing about people generally who are incarcerated. What is the hard, let me tell you the hardest thing yeah, God. that I have to do is find people work who have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I have a stack of resumes on my, on my desk every day and at least one time during the course of the day, I will make a phone call to two or three or four employers and say, do me, a f just do me a favor, just meet the guy, take a chance, give him a shot. Because I, it's so frustrating to have had a criminal past or an incarcerated past 10, 15, 20 years ago and it's still being held against you. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that go on forever? Mm -hmm. We're all, none of us are perfect. 
As part of your statewide effort, uh, are you looking at that? Are you examining that issue? What, 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 is, what is the trajectory of people after they've completed? Yeah, I mean, from, from at the state level, it's really focusing on, we've, we've been meeting with employers, and I think employers are a key part of this mix. And when you're talking about a third of America with a criminal, just, with a criminal record, I mean, at some point, if you're going to hire, you're going to have to hire someone with a criminal record. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, uh, you know, we're going to release 20,000 people this year. I'm not telling you I'm a reference for 20,000 people, but there's a hell of a lot of people coming out of our system I'd be happy to be a reference for. And we just need to take individual chances on people coming out. From our standpoint, we really try to focus on developing marketable job skills at jobs you can actually get with a criminal record. I mean, we try to, to, to take a kind of reality-based And talk about some of the programs you're trying to create for those. Uh, for those vocational projects. programs. So we do fiber optics. Um, we, we have been uh, working with the gas industry, especially when it was booming a couple years ago, mm -hmm. working on fight, pipe fitting, warehousing, food service jobs. But beyond that, we're one of the, we have four uh, <coughs> Pennsylvania universities, including Villanova, Bloomsburg, IUP, and, and Lehigh Community College, are participating in the Pell Grant, um, the Pell Grant experiment, where we're starting to do higher education inside our prisons. The reality is, if someone gets a college degree when they're in prison, they're not coming back. Let me ask you: you, you both have a lot of this under your control. I mean, there are things that you can do. There are levers you can push. There are policies you can you can implement. But how does the national debate affect, either on a programmatic or a political level, your ability to move forward? If we do have a debate this fall in which uh, there is a pushback from the Republican nominee uh, on, on the idea of criminal the idea that maybe we're letting out people who are going to endanger you, suburban family. Uh, how would that affect? How is that uh, like the, the way I look at it? Yeah, Philadelphia is an island, and <laughs> I'm going right to do whatever we have to do with inside our borders to be fair to people. The rest of the state wants to be crazy. The rest of the country wants to be crazy. Go right ahead. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this comes with sanctuary cities, this comes with marijuana yeah. to crim, it comes from, although we're going to do, we're going to take care and keep our people safe uh, and, and treat our people with dignity. And, and that's all under my control, that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. I think an important part of the narrative is that, that there's a big effort right on crime. So just because the nominee says it, right. there's a whole lot of Republicans at the table trying to improve our criminal justice system. So let's not gloss over one, uh, one individual. Uh, we're, we're almost done, but I, I've been dying to ask you for 20 minutes now. Does Donald Trump remind you of Frank Rizzo? No. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I, he reminds me of Vince McMahon. <laughs> okay. There you go. I mean, he comes out backlit with the steam and the yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's like My son's 27. We used to go. He, he was an avid uh, wrestling fan, and I used to have to go to the Wells Fargo Center, mm. well, I guess what it was, whatever the name it was then, um, and go to these things on like Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, watch it on television. And I'm telling you, it is a recreation of the, that exact. Fan base and, and exact characters. Mayor Kenny, Secretary Wessel, you've given us a lot to think about. Will you join me in thanking Thank them? You. And Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kenny and Secretary Wetzel. Uh, thank you, Ron. We'll see you again in a few minutes. But first, some perspective from our supporter. It's my pleasure to welcome Julia Stash, the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And joining her on stage is Vic, Vic Ranth Reddy, who is a senior research fellow with the Charles Koch Institute. Julia, over to you. So we're here to talk a little bit about the bipartisan nature of criminal justice reform. And I see that time is running fast, and so I think we'll do it in sort of a speed dating format. We'll see if we like each other at the end. And so I'm prepared to like you, but let's talk a little bit about how, uh, how progressives look at, um, look at criminal justice reform. Let me first establish a little bit how, why I'm even sitting here. Some of you may not know that the MacArthur Foundation is a private foundation. And as a matter of fact, we, can, we have the luxury of working on absolutely anything that we want to do. And we work on many things, but right now, one of the number one priorities is criminal justice reform in the United States. So that's what brings me here. But let me ask you a question. When, uh, when progressives talk about criminal justice reform, they often talk about it in, the ter in terms of fairness and equity and humanity and respect and tackling the hierarchy of human value that absolutely finds itself replete in our institutions. There's a perception that conservatives come at tr criminal justice reform from a fiscal perspective. So do you, when you talk about it, do you talk about it in terms of fairness and justice and equity? And if so, how? Yeah, I, th I think the notion that we just come at it from a fiscal perspective is wrong. And that's not just a sense I have. I mean, that's kind of uh, demonstrable. You know, the uh, economy collapsed in 2008, but some of the most prominent 
uh, criminal justice reforms in the country in many major red states happened before 08. In Texas, where I come from, it happened in 2007 when the state had a budget surplus. A couple years beforehand, some major reforms were passed in South Carolina and in Kentucky. So I don't think it's just a fiscal argument. That's not to say the fiscal argument doesn't get many people interested, and certainly after 2008, it got more people interested. But a lot of different conservatives talk and think in a lot of different ways that have nothing to do with the fiscal argument. Social conservatives talk a lot about second chances and redemption. They say things like, if we're pro-family, then what are we going to do about these communities and neighborhoods where a third of the fathers are in prison? That's a big conversation point. When you're talking to libertarians, they, they talk about the kind of Orwellian scene of seeing so many of your fellow Americans in cages like animals, something about that. The government overreach, uh, they find uh, terrifying. I think there's even, this is very interesting, and Secretary Wetzel hinted at this a moment ago, even the kind of uh, tough on crime law and order crowd will talk about the fact that there are extremely high recidivism rates, that some of these people who are low-level nonviolent offenders go in, they come out even worse than they started, and uh, we're, we're not getting the best results we can in terms of public safety. I think that's a lot of the conversation. So I think there's convergence there, maybe not consensus, but convergence around a large core of values. Seems to me that sometimes progressives come at the issue with a focus on over-incarceration. Seems to me that I heard you come at it not only from the perspective of humanity, but from the notion that maybe there's a, a degree of over-criminalization. But in the middle of that, there seems to me a well of sort of goodwill on both conservative and progressive uh, perspectives that say that the system actually needs to be fixed. And it seems to me that right now is a need for that fix. There's a need for that political will across the country, both from the front end of the system, where there's jails, all the way to the recidivism challenge coming out of prison. But it seems to me that there are remedies that are, that are congruent across our perspectives. Right. Those remedies could be all the way from uh, greater support for indigent defense, for example, mm -hmm. for smaller amount of time, whether in jail or in prison. Um, but one of the issues that I thought we should talk a little bit about is what is emerging right now in a conversation, and this is this dynamic of pro-cop and anti-cop. Right. How do, what does that mean in your circles? Well, I don't particularly like the framing. I don't know a lot of conservatives who like that framing. It, first of all, it just seems wrong. Uh, if you go back to the very root of what policing has always been intended to be, you know, there's this new movement now for community policing. That's, that's an old movement that's being reborn. When policing was sort of uh, founded in, in London in the 1800s, uh, the whole idea by Sir Robert Peel was community policing. That I think his famous line is, the police are the community and the community are the police. I mean, they're one and the same. So I think that framing is really misguided. And uh, I think most people disagree with it. To the extent that there is anybody that wants to push that kind of a narrative, they're obviously going to lose conservatives. They're obviously going to lose independence. My guess is they lose most liberals also. I just don't think that that framing is correct. I think the framing is not only incorrect, but it's dangerous. And it creates a dynamic that I think people of like minds have to actually push against and pivot away from. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that I can speak for people's who for people whose lived experiences not the same as mine. But I cannot imagine that uh, people who live in a community are actually, they actually want the police to go away. They actually just want the police to do their job. They want them to do the job that is based on respect. They want to be protected. They want police to close the cases. They want them to engage in a human interaction that increases the legitimacy of the role of police in the community. But as a matter of fact, the idea that better policing is enough is not enough. It seems to me that police are just the, at the front end of the entire local criminal justice system. Right. And there are racial and ethnic disparities throughout every point of contact in that system. And so the sense, and I'd like to go back to your point about cost. Cost, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me cost is both fiscal and human. 
and that when we start to put the fiscal cost and the human cost of a system that is seen as not legitimate, we start to have a challenge that our democracy might not even be able to handle. Oh, sure. You know, uh, a few minutes ago you said, Vikran, I talk a lot about over-incarceration, but you talk about over-criminalization. And the reason that I, I talk a lot about over-criminalization is because of that that chain that you're talking about. There's an entire system, there's a timeline here. Much, much earlier in the process, whenever certain things are made illegal uh, that don't need to be, you start triggering all sorts of unnecessary criminal justice complications. I'll give you one example that's become a huge talking point on the right. A lot of people in the room are going to remember the name of Eric Garner. This is the poor man in Staten Island who was put in a chokehold uh, by a New York police officer and, and he died. And uh, there are many, many questions surrounding that. But one question that is commonly asked on the American right is, why in the world was this man interrogated by police officers for selling individual cigarettes on the street corner? Why is that a crime? Why, why did we send these police officers who have very important things to do to protect public safety to go out and do that job? That seemed really counterproductive. And all it does is lead to more interactions between police officers and and Americans, oftentimes black Americans, and some percentage of those encounters are going to go wrong, like that one did. And that's a, that's a sense in which I think it's obviously appropriate to focus on uh, over-incarceration, but it's also appropriate to look earlier in the chain and look at over-criminalization. We should look at every part of the chain. What brings to my mind when you say that is the notion that communities just don't want to be over-policed, but they also don't want to be under-policed. Right. They want to find that balance that says police are doing their appropriate job in the context of community and in the context of supporting the relationship between individuals and their government. Because when that is, you know, when that is torn asunder, you actually begin to diminish the compact, the essential compact between people and their government, the willingness to be governed. And once that happens, I think our entire sort of democratic experiment is at risk. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But I will say, since we're getting down to the two-minute point, we have to decide whether or not we like each other. Well, so, we have two more minutes to decide. So, <laughs> Well, let's, let's do it this way. We're getting really, really close to being in agreement, but do you think there is anything that could derail the agreement at this point? What are the risks for, for consensus on this issue right now? I think the challenge for consensus is a a sense that perhaps we are at an inflection point and the conditions are so, that are propelling negative uh, perceptions about what's happening across America are so inexorable that there's nothing that we can do. And I think that actually there are things that we can do. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that we're here today is because 191, almost 200 jurisdictions signaled to the MacArthur Foundation that they wanted to work on fixing their local systems of justice. That gives me the optimism that there is both political will and human attention to this moment in time. And so I'm optimistic, but I think that we have to steel ourselves against the rhetoric that tells us that this is a time in America that is so dark, it is a time in America where we absolutely have to withdraw within ourselves. We actually have to turn ourselves outward from that and say that this is a time when we can work on our problems. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. I feel like uh, people in, in a room like this probably focus very closely on what's happening on Capitol Hill. They're very interested in Washington. I doubt many people are looking at uh, Pierre, South Dakota or Tallahassee, Florida. But the things that have been happening in those state legislatures over the last several years have been really uplifting. Pierre, South Dakota, three years ago, they passed a major criminal justice reform bill. Uh, a lot of funding was uh, allocated to mental health treatment in Tallahassee, Florida, just this legislative session in 2016. Things like this are happening in states, red states, red state capitals, all over the country. They may not get the glamorous headlines, but they are happening. I think it's a, a real movement, and I'm optimistic. I want to say that not even at the state level, but even today in the New York Times is a profile of the police chief in Stockton, California, yeah. who said he knows that aggressive zero tolerance policing is not what at the end of the day drives crime down and makes people safe. It's a police force that is legitimately engaged with community that over time supports that legitimacy 
which at the end of the day helps control crime. So I'm optimistic and I like you. And I like you too. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
invest in early childhood education, right? 50% of all the public high school Ooh. students in Philadelphia drop out. We have to get kids ready for school. If you want to help me, don't jump on the back of a drug dealer. Help get loved ones, coworkers, into drug rehab. Help people that have mental health problems get the help that they need. Talk about the part. Now, obviously, those are, those are a, a broad a governmental policy sure. choices. But what are the parts? If you, if you say the focus should be on preventing crime, what are the levers under your control? So you, how can you change, move that needle? So it's f in the American criminal justice system, the prosecutor is unique in that we're involved with every part of the criminal justice system. So the DA and whoever I designate decide who gets charged with a crime. What are those charges? Do we ask for bail? God bless you. Um, what are the sentences? You know, we've created 40% of all the misdemeanors in Philadelphia now. We're putting in diversionary programs. If you get your drug and alcohol rehab, if you get mental health assessments, if you do all these different things, we're going to expunge your record. We're doing that with many felonies now. So the prosecutor has the, the ability to work with other people in, in the entire spectrum of the criminal justice system uh, to try to prevent people from getting arrested, how to handle them, what sentence do we ask for, creating diversionary programs. Uh, but it takes political courage, though, because as you heard, you know, if, someone, if I put someone in a diversionary program and then they commit another crime, maybe a heinous crime, then the public might be very, very mad. But all the empirical data shows us giving these people a second chance, addressing their literacy skills, work-ready opportunities, not having a felony conviction. A felony conviction is like an economic death sentence. So, and then you, people, you send somebody to state prison for 10 years, they come home with a felony conviction, they don't have a high school diploma, they have a, a, a PhD in criminality, thuggery, mm -hmm. basically, then they can never get a job. So we have to do all that we can on the front end to ensure that the results on the back end will prevent recidivism. Bill, let me bring you in a minute, because that's certainly where you live, that issue. But let me, Kira, let me ask you your, your answer to the same question. Philadelphia, highest rate uh, uh, of any of the major, largest counties in America. How did it get so high? And in your mind, what are the key steps toward bringing it down responsibly? Well, thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me to this panel yeah. discussion, because I think for far too long, uh, indigent defense providers were not at the seat at the table and, and at the conversation. So I really want to thank you for doing that. What I, what I really think is that, of course, there was a focus on law and order. And funds became available for more practices that allowed for policing and more policing and kind of overuse of our criminal justice system to solve all of our problems, all of our social ills. One of the things that I think we, we're going to need for re true reform to happen is a psychological reform. We're going to have to change the narrative of what public safety is. Public safety shouldn't just be echoed through law enforcement, but they all should be echoed through needs, identifications. Mm -hmm. We spend so much money doing the same thing, like John, Secretary John Wetzel said, and we're, we're not getting the same, we're getting the same results. We're not getting different results. We understand that locking up people with social issues is not a deterrent. So what can we do differently? I think we need to think more creatively. I would love to see the ability of, for us to say, law enforcement, we don't need to pad law enforcement in these areas. Maybe we need to take those, that money and invest it in school therapists. Maybe we need it instead of school officers. Maybe we need to take that money and invest it in therapeutic needs and healthcare professionals that could really address some of this, the underlying issues that are making uh, people have this cyclical type of result in our Let me ask you about, uh, in addition to kind of the broad societal issues that are, that are uh, uh, at play really in every community, one very specific thing about Philadelphia is the amount of time people spend uh, in, in jail. The average length of stay for inmates nationally were 23 days. For Philadelphia, it's about 90 days. Why is that disparity so great? Well, we have to remember the people who are massively incarcerated, we're talking about indigent people, and we're talking about people that have an overworked public defender that is, has a hard-pressed time of spending the uh, time and attention that a person needs. So oftentimes, people are sitting waiting for outcomes that an overworked defense system cannot produce. So while the public defender's office in Philadelphia have amazing disposition uh, rates because we have been so seen by the MacArthur Foundation to um, to dispose of our cases a lot quicker than anyone else. I just think that people have uh, go by this, you know, methodical system that we're not looking at why are we going, taking a person through 14 different, uh, you know, hearings to get to a certain mm -hmm. result. Can't we speed up that process and take out some of these bureaucratic, um, uh, you know, policies that do not make any sense? 
we can have a person that could have a case rescheduled maybe uh, it, it, as much as 14 times. That's a lot. Why do we need that? And we need to figure out where are we wasting time and where can we speed up this process? Bill, uh, the district attorney used a very strong term. He said a felony conviction is an economic death sentence, if I'm remembering the, uh, the term. Is that your experience? What, what do you say? And, and what does it take to kind of get, in that sense, a commutation? So, Ron, that is my lived experience, and that's the experience of the more than 350,000 Philadelphians who have been in conflict with the criminal justice system. Um, if you take a look at people who are living in inescapable deep poverty and you overlay their criminal justice interactions, you'll find that nearly 90 to 95 percent of those individuals, their family members or themselves, have been in conflict with the criminal justice system. Hmm. Is it an economic death sentence? Absolutely. Um, personally, I've been home for over 16 years. Um, as recently as two years ago, I applied for a position. I got hired for the position. I was terminated based upon that two, that 1994 conviction. Um, I'm articulate. I'm educated. I'm readily willing and able to positively impact a company's or corporation's bottom line. But as he's indicated, not lots of people who have been in conflict with the criminal justice system are actually as well-spoken as I am or as educated. So if an individual such as myself has very difficult time finding viable employment from time to time, then quite naturally it is an economic death sentence for many of the Philadelphians who are involved with the criminal justice. I have a feeling this is a question to which the answer uh, is going to be both. But what is a bigger problem? The equipping the, you know, the formerly incarcerated with the skills, soft skills and hard skills to succeed, or um, acculturating employers to be willing to take the chance on hiring someone? So the bigger problem is changing the culture, changing the mindset, mm -hmm. changing the belief that an individual who has been in conflict with the criminal justice system is not like every individual who is actually watching this event. Um, 70 million Americans have been arrested and or convicted. That's nearly a third of our population. Mm -hmm. We arrest doctors, lawyers, politicians. Some of the brightest minds in the world have been through prison doors in America. So the second would actually be the correct answer. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Jump in. it's not necessarily a commercial for my friend, yeah. but Jeff Brown and his wife Sandy own 13 shop rights in Philadelphia. They are the number one employer of people with felony convictions. And he thinks it's a part of his business model that they've become great employees. Many of them are tremendous salespeople. They have tremendous skills that need to be directed in the right way. And then once he hires them, they become tremendous champions of his stores. And he employs people that are in that community, within that zip code. And that's a tremendous model. And when they had riots in Baltimore as a result of uh, Freddie Gray's death, mm. People in that community stood around his shop right to protect his shop right because they know he's investing in the community. So we need to recognize uh, business owners like that and promote that. And, and can, oh, go ahead, yeah, sure, I, here. I think we, we, uh, Seth is absolutely right, but we also need higher level employment opportunities to, available for people who have high functioning uh, skills. I think one of the things that we see oftentimes is that some of the jobs that are available for people with records are low end jobs. Not to discredit uh, Brown ShopRite jobs because they are actually jobs, but when people cannot reach middle class citizenship so that they can afford college for their, their, uh, their children and their second generation, it really gets frustrating. And so it becomes a, a situation as to whether or not William Cobb has the skills, the experience, the education to fulfill a job at Boeing or to fill a job in the healthcare industry, but he cannot get that because of his label. I think there's a problem there where we're talking about really giving people economic empowerment. You know, and we're thinking about the levers, the different levers mm -hmm. that are available to reduce the burden of incarceration on the society. How valuable or important would it be to get a better handle on providing opportunity and thus reducing recidivism? I think uh, it would be extremely valuable, and I don't think it's so difficult, in a way, once we have the political will uh, to do so. And I just want to relate a couple of facts from the research. People often cite that recidivism is quite high, 
two-thirds or so of people recidivating after within three years of release. But that's misleading because most people who enter the system don't recidivate. It's just some of them recidivate a lot over oh, and over oh. again. So two-thirds of those who enter don't recidivate even if you look out 10, 15 years, okay? So what we need to do is think about kind of a bifurcated strategy. Once people have been out and shown themselves to not recidivate, their chance of committing another crime becomes vanishingly small and indistinguishable from the rest of the population. So in some states, they are uh, establishing kind of automatic expungement after a certain period of time. So in Massachusetts, for example, if it's eight years after a felony, employers can't see that information, but district attorneys can. So we release the information in a way that is relevant to those who are, um, who are utilizing it. And I think that would come toward helping change the culture because people are over concerned about some people's uh, um, chances of reconvicting. So I think we can separate out which Bill, policies affect Bill, because I was going to ask you, I mean, as you were talking before, is the key kind of, you know, meeting with employers one by one or in groups and kind of talking, are there policies, public policies that could uh, tilt this uh, conversation in a way that was more productive? So that's a great question. So policy actually ends up driving culture after it's been in place for a significant amount of time. So that's why our organization aims to change systemic discrimination practices, because we can't address it one employer by one employer. We have to have policies and legislation in place that protect people who have been in conflict with the criminal justice system. And lots of people have talked about political will today. Right. Um, the political will will change when people who have been adversely impacted by the criminal justice system are voting based upon their values. We have to identify individuals who will put forward our platform. We have to support those particular individuals. We have to put them in office. We have to hold them accountable to be able to change policy and legislation, yeah. which will ultimately change political will. It, it was William Faulkner in the Civil Rights Act who said uh, you cannot legislate what is in men's hearts. And someone responded, if you change their behavior, eventually their hearts, you change the legal behavior, eventually their hearts will follow. Which I think is a segue, if I could. Um, plagiarism is bad in journalism, correct? Right, it is. As a DA, plagiarism is a great thing. My job is to try to find the best practice anywhere and see mm -hmm. if we can replicate it here in Philadelphia. Convention speech is more mixed, right. apparently. Okay, yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, did not, I'm not Sorry. a black woman, I did not I attend Princeton yeah, University. Yeah, exactly, but, but yes, um, trying to find the best practices. Right. So, but the point is, if our goal is to stop people from selling drugs on the street, right, we can do, there are ways we can figure out how to do that other than locking people up in state prison for a long time. And think about all the, you know, the consequences that happen to them after that. So I stole an idea from the former district attorney of San Francisco, she's running for the Senate now, Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. she's the Attorney General of California. She called it back on track. We're spending about $40,000 a year sending people to state prison for committing felonies, where we had a recidivism rate of about 63%. When they came out, they got rearrested. So either on the far left wing or the far right wing perspective, it was a terrible failure. So what we do, and we stole from her, was that we have a, career, a program here called The Choice Is Yours. So we take those young men and women that could go to state prison for two years or more, and instead, we take a timeout, we work with the public defender, they enter a no contest plea, that we give them life skills training, right? Show up on time, pull your pants up, don't get another tattoo over your eyelids, mm. those types of things. Literacy training, job skills training. And if they successfully complete the program in the one year, we expunge their record. It only costs us about $4,000 a year to do this, and the recidivism rate has only been about 8%, right? So if the goal, so we have to find out what is the goal, let's use empirical data, and let's make it work. And that's an example, one example of a program that we can do that. One of the things I like for us to do, though, is like Secretary Russell suggested, look at data more closely. What uh, Seth Williams has just described is a solution that worked. Why can't we do that on the front end? And I'm talking about on the very beginning. Right. When kids are in school, we start to understand what their needs are, what their post-traumatic history are, is, and why, cannot, why can't we provide those types of services outside the criminal justice context? Right. One of the things we have in our system is we, what we call child welfare, and that's the first glimpse of what kids' trajectory is going to be. We see kids that are abused mm. and neglected all the time, and oftentimes those are the same people we see funneled through our criminal justice system, but we never include that in the conversation. If we put more resources on the front end, hopefully we can stop 
the cycle. And I don't see that there's much correlation that goes on between criminal justice stakeholders that take that population right. and identify them as kids with disabilities. This may have been a question more appropriate for the mayor, but I, I do wonder, can you stop that cycle without dealing with the concentration of poverty that we are now seeing? You know, uh, three quarters of African Americans uh, public school students nationwide now attend schools where a majority of their classmates qualify as poor or low income, two thirds of Hispanics, it's about a third of whites. Um, you know, you, you can have lots of interventions in school, but when you're dealing with that level of concentrated economic isolation, are you always gonna be disappointed in the results? Well, I, mean, I think the mayor and Secretary Wetzel, and all of us would agree, um, and he said much more eloquently than I could, you know, Philadelphia, 34% of our city lives at or below the national poverty level. Of the 10 largest cities in America, we have the greatest percentage of our citizens living at or below the poverty level, and the greatest living in deep poverty, however mm -hmm. they define that. Mm -hmm. And so until, yes, until we address job opportunities, educational opportunities, making the public school system in Philadelphia a place that everyone would want to send their children, um, then we're going to continue to see the same problems. Hey, Bill, you want to? Yeah, to oh, piggyback yeah. on what Seth is saying, where we're spending the money is where we're getting a result. Um, as I watch um, the secretary and the mayor sit on stage, I thought about the budgets that they allocated to criminal justice um, enforcement. Um, you're talking about a prison system that invests $2.4 billion a year for state prisons. City of Philadelphia just recently passed a budget that's close to almost $300 million for our county prisons, which uh, house poor and drug addicted individuals. How much money are we spending on social service programs? How much money are we spending on reentry efforts? How much money are we spending on these poor communities that we know are going to eventually end up in our prison system? We're getting a proper return on our investment. Yeah. And yet, and yeah, but even, even in poor communities, certainly there is a need for order, right? There is a need for safety. Right, we, and, perhaps, and it's even greater than... But that's the example. But, but, we have to hold people accountable, but Kier was right. We have to provide these services on the front end. Right? We cut down all these services for mental health in the community. We're still spending that money, though. We are. Los Angeles County is the number one provider of mental health treatment right. in their prison system. Right. New York City is second. Cook County is third. So we need to provide those mental health assessments much earlier, grade school, get people the help they need early, not let them act out hurt someone, get arrested, go to prison, and then let, get the Let me bring in the audience for questions. And let me just a, you know, a, a quick question here, you know, because there's been this debate, and certainly we might hear a little bit this week at a Democratic convention about the role of the crime bill of 1994, which was, which was very controversial. But one thing that I think isn't controversial is that the revival we're seeing in cities, with many cities adding population, showing economic dynamism, might not have been possible without the reduction in crime that all, basically, all large cities have seen since the early 1990s, is, is um, w how do you kind of, uh, in your mind, um, weigh the importance of reducing crime as part of the overall economic vitality of cities? Oh, reducing crime, the reductions in crime that we've observed to taking us uh, from the highs in the early 90s to the, to the level now of the late 60s, I think has been tremendously important in the, a number of ways for our economic development, for the revival of cities, for um, everyone's sense of well-being. And I think now is the time to really capitalize on that and reverse some of the overreach that was accomplished at the same time. And there are things that we could talk about, about how to do that and rolling back the, the long sentences that were a part of that effort as well. We don't need the same kind of apparatus that was put into place in the not sure. Let's go to the, oh, we're gonna go to the audience. Okay. We only got a few minutes. Let, let, me, let me go to the audience and you can say, hopefully answer. Do we have yeah. questions? Do we have questions? Well, if we don't have questions. We, we back. Not. Oh, we got we one in the back. back. Okay. I see it. You Curly see it. hair? Yeah, there we go. Good eyes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Kanisha Marks. I actually work at the Defenders oh. with Kier. <laughs> um, I have a question about detainers, uh, probation detainers in particular. Um, I'm not talking about technical, well, I'm talking about both technical and potential direct violations. Um, the technical where we are locking people up as opposed to giving them drug or alcohol assistance when that is usually what the technical violations are. Um, and then as well as potential direct violations and detainers, which seem in my mind to under, under, undermine the constitutional right to innocent until proven guilty. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about detainers and if well, you're right. doing anything about that. Well, first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you actually like stopped me. Uh, so uh, what I would say is that, like I said before, there needs to be a culture shift, right? When we put people on probation, it doesn't mean that they're going to come out and become 
Boy Scouts or Wall Street executives. We have to understand progress. And what we don't do oftentimes in our system is have a tolerance for progress. And so I don't, I don't know if this is totally answering your question in terms of the constitutionality of being innocent till proven guilty, but we're talking about the back end of a person's sentence. I do want to squeeze yeah. this in, though. Please, because yeah. when we talk about the back end, we talk about a lot of the legislation that has been put in place to continue to punish people even after they serve their sentences. And it, the ABA has found that there are 900 legislative acts that affect people with criminal mm. justice records. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of legislation that is being pushed out to people who don't even see the impact. And the, for those who don't even have to measure that impact. And I think some of it is, how do we use our system to produce the outcomes we want? If we're so no tolerance when it comes to people on probation and we can't recognize progress, then we're always going to get the same result. We're actually going to make people more desperate so because right. they lose so much more. I think part of the answer that I would also give is that, um, and it will help us reduce, you talked earlier about the prison population mm -hmm. in Philadelphia and how large it is, and the percentage, about 60 to 70 percent are people that are either waiting, waiting trial yeah. Or, as a young lady has pointed out, um, we're on probation and we're found to be in violation and we're then sent back for this detainer or being mm -hmm. held for the detainer into the hearing. So we can address that, and Kieran and I agree, um, through what's called day reporting centers. Right? So I would like to create in Philadelphia, the reason why we have bail before trial is that we are either worried the person is not going to show up because they have a record of failing to appear or because the, the, trial, the case itself is so severe. Well, there are a lot of people that instead of locking them up, and having three shifts of guards watch them all day and us giving them medicine and feeding them all day, we can have them go to a place not far from their home in their neighborhood where if they have a job, they won't have to lose their job, they won't have to lose their apartment or their house, and they go to a day reporting center in the evenings, maybe for two hours, and while they're there, they might get some literacy training, or a drug and alcohol addiction uh, you know, talking group with folks. And so that would be a way for us to reduce the prison population, get the people the services they need, and, and keep it moving. And, I'd like to work with and, Seth on yeah. that. Yeah. And can, we, those, can we shake on that? I'd like to and, work with Seth uh, and, on bringing Dave Report and said it's and for, the people that, <laughs> and for the people that had their convention last week, it saves money. So it has greater outcomes, and it will mm -hmm. save us money. Bill, somehow that makes you Clinton to Yaf Ya Arafat and Rabin, I think. That's, <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> that famous photo. Um, can I ask a final question, uh, which, which uh, going back to something I asked the mayor, the, the city has set this ambitious goal of reducing their jail population by a third over the next three years. Can I maybe just go down the road? What will be the biggest obstacle to actually meeting that goal? The biggest obstacle to actually meeting that goal is for everyone to take a real honest look at their practices and decide we have to change them. Also, the day reporting centers don't have to happen on the back end. They should happen on the front end. So not having enough community resources available, when you reduce the population, there has to be something for them to do. So if we're missing that piece, we're never going to succeed in understanding how well this will work. Bill? Um, my opinion that the biggest obstacle is getting elected officials to reallocate or disinvest from criminal justice as they currently are. 300 million for state road is too much money. 2.4 billion for state prisons is too much money. A portion of those monies need to go to doing things like Seth suggests and a whole litany of other things that will actually equal opportunity for people who've been in conflict with the criminal justice Mr. System. Attorney? Well, I think we're gonna be successful in Philadelphia. So I'm not gonna talk about mm -hmm. the alternative. I think our success- What will it take to be successful? Our, be it'll, it'll take the political will to use empirical data, um, for DAs and public defenders and defense attorneys not just to have adversarial relationships, but to be problem solvers. But I think we're going to solve the problem in Philadelphia. And then the reason why MacArthur gave us the grant, so that we can then be a, a beacon of hope for other jurisdictions of what they can do, learn from us, so that they can replicate that across the if country. If you had a bet, do you think the path you've laid out gets you there, or are you going to be adjusting and recalibrating as you go? Well, that's what we have to do Always right. every be day. Better. We and meet monthly, our criminal justice advisory board. We talk about what's working, what's not working. So there'll be bumps and hiccups along the way. We have to learn from that, readjust, keep it moving. Do, do, do we know what, how other municipalities have successfully reduced their jail populations? What have been the keys? Yeah, I, th I think the key thing is that all the different actors are working on it at the same time right. as each other. The criminal justice system has people responding. The police respond to the prosecutors, respond to the jailers. And um, what you need is everybody doing it all at the same time to make a reform stick. I think it's very easy to just fall back into old patterns. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank this panel's been terrific. Would you thank join me in thanking them?
2nd. Um, I hope you will visit uh, the Atlantic website and uh, take a look at our Next America page where my great colleague, Juleka Lantigua Williams, is producing cutting edge reporting on all of these issues every day. And third, uh, our next event this afternoon will focus on young women voters and how political parties can better understand them. Join us at 4.45 p.m. for a panel featuring actress Amber Tamlin and young women leaders. Thank you and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.